Thank you all for uh, coming tonight. My name is Osman Keshwars. I am a uh, PhD student in the Department of Economics at the University of Massachusetts and a member of Socialist Resurgence. Uh, I'll be moderating tonight. I'll start off with uh, brief remarks and uh, then I'll introduce uh, our speakers, our, our panel members for tonight. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about uh, the fight for housing justice uh, that's been going on in, in Connecticut, also worldwide, but specifically what's been going on in Connecticut. Um, COVID-19 has shown us how fragile the, the global economic system has become. Uh, at the one year anniversary of discovery, the discovery of the virus, countries, the United States in particular, have basically uh, abandoned all hope of containing the virus. This has resulted in a sort of worst of both worlds outcome for poor and working people in the country, where we face either the possibility of exposure to a deadly virus uh, or the possibility of staying at home, being evicted, not being able to buy food, not being able to make rent. One of the most pressing concerns for working people during the pandemic is housing. For renters, drastic drops in income and layoffs mean that uh, people are not going to know. People don't know where the next uh, rent payment is going to come from. For owners, the bank doesn't care if you're laid off. The bank doesn't care if your hours are reduced. The bank is going to take its mortgage payment one way or another. Stimulus in March was barely enough to cover one month's rent, let alone uh, nine. Six hundred dollars that was just passed in December is more like a joke than anything else. So the two things that have been keeping people afloat for the past year is uh, expanded unemployment insurance and eviction moratoriums till the end of uh, December. Uh, these were extended till the end of January, but this is more kicking the can down the road than anything else. Um, without these two things, the end of January will see foreclosure and eviction crisis like this country has never seen. So briefly, uh, Connecticut is facing uh, Connecticut households seventy seven between seventy seven thousand and one hundred and sixty one thousand Connecticut households are at eviction risk. This uh, uh, the the number the the dollar amount of rent that has not been paid in Connecticut is somewhere between one hundred twenty two billion and two hundred twenty two billion dollars uh, as of the last week of November. Most of these are, are disproportionately concentrated in low-income, working-class, Black and Latino households. Better-off households are uh, getting by by selling off cars, assets, other things. Those that can't are making uh, 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 the ones that are facing uh, eviction most critically are making do with uh, help from friends or family or racking up credit card debt. As workers are driven further into precarity, home ownership is increasingly seen as a necessary step towards maintaining a decent standard of living. Yet even those shrinking numbers of working class families that manage to buy a house and even maybe become small time landlords simply become vehicles through which value is transferred to the top, either after a recession, when mortgage holders are wiped out and massive private equity firms buy up housing for pennies on the dollar, or an old age when equity is sucked out through things like reverse mortgages so that retired workers can maintain at least the semblance of a dignified life. Because housing is so basic a necessity, the working class movement and the fight to build socialism must center demands for housing justice. Tonight, Socialist Resurgence is thrilled to have three activists currently engaged in the struggle for housing justice in Connecticut. First up, uh, we have Rasmus from Cancel Rent CT. I'm going to turn it over to you, Rasmus, uh, and we'll have questions after all of the speakers have spoken. Thank you, Osman, for the kind words and introduction. Um, my name is Rasmus. Uh, I'm a member of Cancel Rent Connecticut since the kind of organization of the group back in April, May. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm also involved in student labor groups at Yale University in New Haven, including Given Rising. Um, as well as in my home state of Iowa with Iowa Student Action. Um, I'm also a graphic design and architecture student, so I've been involved in a number of design projects with um, anti-gentrification movements in New Haven, as well as community land trusts and 
alternative modes of decommodified housing. So I'm really excited to be here, excited to learn and share and discuss with you all today about um, the eviction crisis that tenants and workers are facing in Connecticut and how we can organize against it. Rasmus, go ahead, you're up. Sure, would you like me to share any further, Osman? Yeah. Uh, why don't you talk about uh, the, the 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 struggles you've engaged in and, and yes and, yeah and how okay people. what's your yeah yeah go, uh, yeah. go into it like what's okay your, yeah yeah uh, sorry I'm doing a roundtable yeah yeah, yeah yeah I appreciate that um well yeah um as some of you might be aware uh, I see some familiar faces in the audience um cancel rent has been organizing uh, since the beginning of the pandemic around comprehensive rental relief the only form of which is equitable and fair um, is the cancellation of rent. Um, so since uh, kind of the impetus of the group, we've been um, organizing around putting pressure on legislators, especially during the summer. We had a number of legislative actions um, at the Capitol, um, mobilizing tenants, mobilizing networks that we already have um, kind of uh, bases within, including legal associations, to uh, put pressure through direct action, um, through legal advocacy, um, on Governor Lamont and his administration to cancel rents and provide true support for tenants and workers in Connecticut. Um, the results of the pressure have been mixed. Um, obviously, rent is not canceled in Connecticut, but the eviction moratoriums were um, extended, and uh, Lamont has had some, some open dialogue with uh, at least the legal observers and um, legal advocates. Um, now, of course, this isn't enough. This isn't um, uh, canceling rent, and certainly isn't um, the kind of tenant-centered uh, housing policy that we need. But there's definitely a window right now um, due to the kind of advocacy that we've been engaged in the last you know, seven, eight months. Uh, moving towards the fall, um, a lot of our work kind of shifted to direct action and uh, kind of the sword and shield model, which some of you might be familiar with, of uh, tenant defense and tenant organizing. Um, because of the legal sort of support and association with um, uh, legal associations like New Haven Legal Assistance and CT Fair Housing, um, we've been able to do direct outreach to many tenants facing evictions who have, you know, public eviction cases and records um, and actually provide them with legal services, um, walk them through what is an incredibly confusing process with the, the, the CDC moratorium uh, and the various loopholes that are built into that um, and provide, you know, oftentimes a, a, a either space to find alternative housing, um, extension of the moratorium if they qualify for the CDC's protections, um, or in some cases, uh, some cases uh, combined with direct, act, direct action um, are actually able to prevent the eviction from happening entirely and um, get rent canceled on a case by case basis. This, uh, this kind of model came, I think, to uh, most fruition last, last month, I guess, um, in a case with a Stratford tenant, um, two tenants actually who um, had COVID um, and were dealing with the illness um, and you know, struggling with their health at the time, but luckily got in touch with legal services. Um, and through that network we've been de developing over the last couple of months, um, got in touch with Cancel Rent Connecticut. Um, and so within around 12 hours, um, one of our legal coordinators, Shaz at CT for Housing, um, dropped kind of the, the, the link to the group and we mobilized around 25 people, including News 12, um, to come to the, the tenant's household. Um, of course, you know, collaborating with her um, all throughout this process and offer a sort of um, uh, in-person direct action in case marshals actually showed up um, and she lost the eviction case that she was facing that day. Um, luckily, we were able to, on the legal, legal side of things, um, win that case, win a, a favorable settlement that allowed her more time to uh, find alternative housing and extension um, of, her, of her current lease, um, as well as the, the cancellation of her rent for at least a period of time. Um, Shaz can offer more, um, more details if she's in the audience. Um, but otherwise, um, basically an effective, effective measure that, 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 that we employed, and we're looking to expand um, in the months ahead, especially now that we have this a slightly extended window um, of the CDC moratorium. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see that there are many people in the audience. We've been doing a lot of outreach to get volunteers and other tenants at, you know, from a variety of locations through legal services, but also I've been doing a lot of outreach at um, local soup kitchens, including desks in New Haven, where I reside, um, in order to, 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 to talk with tenants, to speak with people who are also, you know, might be uh, immediately facing eviction. Um, even though there's a moratorium, many people are still being evicted through the loopholes in, in the CDC's, um, CDC's moratorium. So we're looking right now, I think, to, to expand the model that we've been developing over the last couple of months to, to get more volunteers who are able to go door to door to talk with tenants and to, again, eventually bring tenants together to, to, to larger and um, I think more radical direct actions. 
certainly that's what's going to be needed to pressure Lamont's um, and pressure also local municipalities to really reorganize their, their rent relief around rent cancellation um, and to stop siding on um, the side of, of, of landlords and speculative real estate interests. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to, to, to speak more as we go throughout the, the, the talk. I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up around council rent that I can. Um, but most of all, you know, I'm really, you know, coming myself with a kind of background in urban studies and thinking about the historical moment we're in, which certainly I think as many of you know, is, is not isolated from conversations about redlining, conversations about, you know, racist um, exclusionary zoning, conversations that um, I think, you know, Reverend Johnson will touch on, I'm sure, and as well um, as Dan um, in their own conversations. Um, I think with a historical understanding of housing in Connecticut, we will be much better positioned to really build and develop and expand a tenants movement um, that really, you know, if I'm going to be frank, um, is owed the cancellation of rents. This is not a matter of kind of a moral um, justice or really a tenants owing anything to their landlords. This is, this is uh, something that is owed to tenants and workers in this country who have, you know, built and maintained um, what we have today and what world we live in. So excited to build that power with you all, excited to learn more about the organizing and hear about your own um, experiences and your own work. Thank you, Rasmus. Um, so we are going to, we're going to have all the speakers present first and then we'll, we'll go into a discussion. Uh, we'll open it up for everybody to discuss at the end. So uh, next we have uh, Reverend A.J. Johnson. Uh, he's of the, from the Urban Hope Refuge Church of Hartford, also a community organizer with the Center for Leadership and Justice. He's also part of a coalition that's currently uh, bringing a segregation lawsuit against uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. So uh, Reverend Johnson, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thank you so much, Osmond. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, uh, Rasmus, hopefully I got your name right. Uh, and thank you, John, who you don't see, but it's really pulling the strings in the background there. Um, my name, as was stated, is Pastor A.J. Johnson. Uh, I am a community organizer with the Center for Leadership and Justice, uh, but I also pastor a uh, church in the north end of Hartford, uh, the 06120 zip code, in which a lot of uh, the stuff that uh, Rasmus has um, alluded to in his brief presentation is happening. Um, you know, I guess I'll give you some context before I talk about the lawsuit because the lawsuit isn't gonna, is not going to make any sense without the context, right? Uh, so uh, my church sits, um, again, in the 06120 zip code, and uh, it's considered um, the poor side of town, it's considered uh, the hood, it's considered the ghetto, it's considered, uh, to most white folks, you don't go there after five o'clock, um, so most of the traffic coming out of Hartford is headed into the, the suburbs of Greater Hartford uh, before, you know, before dark, it's, it's considered as one of those places. Uh, with it being considered one of those places, obviously uh, we have high crime. Obviously we have uh, a lot of things that you hear about in the news at five o'clock. Um, but some stuff that you don't hear about in Hartford is the housing and what the housing conditions look like and how deplorable the housing conditions are. And uh, a couple years ago through my um, not only do my love for the community, but I think my job that I have as a community organizer with the Center for Leadership and Justice and my ministry, uh, serving in a ministry in Hartford, I think those two kind of exist like this. I don't see them as separate. Most churches and most people see social justice or justice work as separate from ministry. Uh, I don't, personally, my opinion, I don't believe those two things are in separate buckets. I think Christ calls us to do not only the charitable things, which is to feed people and help people and, and, and clothe people, but I also think that uh, Christ calls us to do uh, the work of justice. Um, and so uh, my congregation in Hartford uh, is a part of the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance, which is a congregation of, uh, or a organization of 38 other congregations looking to do the work of justice in the Greater Hartford area. And so as a part of my job and as a part of my ministry, uh, I had a phone call uh, from a parent at a local community school asking me to go take a look at 
uh, a young lady's house because this young lady's daughter was coming to school with mice bites on uh, on her. And um, I went to the unit and this was a H Hispanic young woman. And as I went to her unit, uh, she was not there. I called her and said, ma'am, why did you miss our appointment? You desperately wanted me to come by. You're not here. What's up? Uh, only to find out that she was at St. Francis Hospital getting, she has six children getting her youngest daughter stomach pump due to the fact that she ingested mice poison. Uh, and as I went to St. Francis Hospital, uh, went to the ER, she came out to visit me, but as she was coming out, she had two social workers there uh, trying to uh, remove her six children from her due to neglect. And she didn't have like a real grasp of the Eng English language, but I understood enough of what she was saying and what she was trying to say to them. And what she so eloquently said to me is that this is not my fault. Uh, you know, the landlord only drops off sticky traps uh, and expects me to fight this, this mice problem. I was like, well, how many mice are you dealing with? Um, and it turned to be about 18 mice a day that, you know, is finding their way into her cabinets, finding their way into her, her food, her Similac, and uh, all these different things. And I said, well, this isn't, this isn't your fault because you don't own the property. Um, and so uh, from that moment on, opened up two years worth of uh, organizing with over 300 families in the Clay Arsenal neighborhood in Hartford, uh, where we l went into their units and not only found that they you know, I, I thought it was secluded to one apartment building. I uh, went to her apartment building and uh, on Albany Avenue, right there, not far from the Argo Stadium, right? A multi-million dollar thing that is highlighting Hartford, less than a block or two away was this deplorable apartment um, and realized that everyone in her building was dealing with uh, deplorable conditions from mold to mice to all these different things. And that let that enraged me, you know, like as an organizer, you know, one of the characteristics is anger, right? And so uh, I was angry and not only was I angry, but the people who were living there only to find out long story short that the person who owned that building owned 25 other buildings in that same neighborhood, uh, which made up 33% uh, percent of the public housing stock in North Hartford. And so with that, you know, it was 150 units and 300 families that were living in deplorable conditions. And hence the question was asked, you know, uh, a lot of folks asked me, well, why, why, why didn't they move? You know, why, why don't they just get up and move? Uh, we learned that through a public program called Section 8 or project-based housing, that the subsidies that they received, the help that they receive, isn't given to the individual. It was given to the landlord in the unit. So the landlord has all of the power in this particular program, because if you're dealing with mice, if you're dealing with deplorable things uh, and things are not being done, your only option is to go into a, uh, a housing market, you know, which if you were to go down to any section eight or any public housing place and ask for public housing, there's a wait list of 5,000 to 10,000 people. So if you ask a single mom of six, if she's gonna fight to have her unit fixed uh, or go out in a housing market where she'll be probably, you know, in a shelter or couch surfing with her kids, she's going to deal with the issues. But the problem is, uh, what we found is that that landlord was in direct violation uh, of his contract with HUD, direct violation with the city of Hartford and their tax abatement. So we organized residents back in 2008 and 2009 to, uh, to fight back against HUD, in which they were successful, they canceled their, um, they canceled the contracts for those buildings. But then the question became, all right, where are these people going to go? Um, and so then kind of raised another part of this housing fight, which uh, I didn't know was that bad until you know we're living it out today. Is that uh, when these folks got these vouchers, a good amount of them wanted to move out of Hartford, uh, uh, second eight apartments are like gold in poor communities because as white folks uh, give property to their children and their grandchildren, so same with project-based housing. They give it to their children and they give it to their grandchildren. 
So nobody really owns anything. They're just living in deplorable conditions because that's the best that they can do. Um, and, you know, and one lady was living there for 18 years. She, she's like, I, I own this building and I'm living in deplorable conditions, right? I've lived here 18 years, raised kids here, grandkids, great grandkids, all, I mean, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so they canceled the, the, the contract and um, uh, now it's, you know, where are these people going to go? And so what we realized is uh, the folks who wanted to move out of Hartford uh, into the suburban spaces like Glastonbury, West Hartford, Simsbury, Avon, uh, all of the berries, I call them all of the berries. Uh, they wanted to move into those spaces and realize that there was no opportunity for them in those spaces. And then, uh, I mean, so obviously if there are no opportunities in those spaces, uh, well, what's gonna happen? I mean. Again, there's certain things about the case I can share and some I can't, um, but obviously uh, the relocation assistance that was promised to these people did not happen um, because a lot of them were stuck back in what we call lower opportunity neighborhoods, which is where I live. I don't like to call it a low opportunity neighborhood because I think Hartford is a great place to live. Um, but if you match Hartford up against uh, you know, Avon or Simsbury or Glastonbury, Clearly, those median incomes are two different, you know, two different realms, right? So these people wanted to go to these places, they could not. And so what we realized is, one, that there is no affordable housing in suburban neighborhoods, which to me sounds like what Dr. King uh, was fighting for back in 19, you know, 1965, 1966, uh, with the Fair Housing Act, in which he wanted to pass to desegregate these spaces. Um, but in 2020, we are still just as segregated as we were in 1968. And so the problem is, is that there is, uh, there is still segregation when it comes to people of color wanting to go to uh, suburban spaces. Um, and the lawsuit is only a lawsuit uh, that names HUD uh, because they perpetuated segregation. The thing that they're supposed to fight against they perpetuated it by putting people back in low income spaces. And so when we talk about uh, canceling rent, when we talk about uh, the evictions, we have to understand a lot of us spent this quarantine in places that we kind of like to be. But for a good part of people which attend my church and which I talk to and, and dwell with every day, a lot of those folks weren't in spaces that they are comfortable in being in. And so when we say that we're gonna uh, cancel rent uh, and allow them to stay and give the landlord uh, help, I think that is a, I, I think that's a noble thing, but I think we also need to further the conversation and uh, make sure that our cities and towns are set up to house people of color uh, in them. And I'll end that right there. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, uh, so I, I'm already getting a few questions. So just a reminder, I'll, I'll read out your questions uh, after our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is uh, Dan Piper, who's a teacher and a rank and file CEA member and uh, a, a 2020 socialist resurgence candidate for state rep in Connecticut. So Dan, take it away. Thank you, Osman. Thank you, Reverend AJ. Thank you, Rasmus, for coming and speaking. Um, Osman, at the beginning, said we had three activists, and I don't really feel like that was a, a fair classification, <laughs> um, putting me in the same category as Rasmus and uh, Reverend Johnson, um, in, in, the, in the sense that uh, I have not participated in anything as significant as what the other two speakers have been working on. Um, although uh, I am in a relatively new group called the Connecticut Workers Crisis Response, which though it has not done any substantial concrete work on this question, I think there is uh, a, a, a valuable perspective that, that its existence can, can perhaps lend to all of this. Um, so I'd like to start with talking about the the situation we're in right now and what it is getting people to think about. So Congress just passed this new relief package, which 
extends a CDC ordered moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, or sorry, on evictions, it extends it just to January 31st. It was going to end in, in just a few days from now, um, and uh, people who are using it get it for just a little bit longer. Uh, and it pertains to my understanding about 30 to 40 million people in the United States are in danger of being evicted, are way behind in rent. I mean, I've heard all kinds of anecdotes like, you know, a, uh, a friend of a friend is the only person in his apartment right now actually paying rent. And so people have months of rent that is going to be due very soon. And at the same time, these extraordinary measures have been taken to uh, address the massive housing crisis and the, and the potential homelessness crisis. And moments like these are important because uh, we have been in a long-term housing crisis. Um, and Reverend Johnson makes, I think, some important points about what that looks like. Um, but it's moments where things get sharp, where not only people start to say, we've had enough, and they start to call for more serious measures and deeper measures to deal with the problem. But we also are able to see the situation we're in as one that is not natural. We're able to see the system as a system, as a, as a specific social order that doesn't need to be permanent. And, I, and that is important too. And people are able to see that, not just because it's an extreme crisis, but also because they're able to see who's benefiting they're able to see what kinds of measures can be taken in a situation like this. Just all of a sudden, Congress can release $900 billion. Uh, we can have an, an, a, a moratorium on evictions and you know, the economy doesn't collapse. Uh, all, or even more so, the rich are, are even richer. You know, I mean, not that, I, not he's, not that he's exactly a, a, a hero of mine, but Robert Reich made the argument, made the point that you could, if you just took the billionaires, the billionaires in the United States could get could give every American three thousand dollars, and they would still be richer now than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. So even while there are millions of people not working, or working much less, and the economy is working much less well than it is normally, the rich are still getting richer. And so we're seeing things like demand for cancellation of rent. We're seeing a serious organization for uh, reparations for desegregation, and I think it's worth discussing where all this can go. So I think first just to touch a bit more on why there is long-term housing crisis. I mean, one piece is that average move-in rents in the U.S. have more than doubled in the last 20 years. So even before there was a COVID crisis, um, people were paying more and more of their own take-home income in rents. In uh, Latino and African-American communities, the percentage of income going towards rent uh, is, is about, it averages towards almost 50% of one's income. And there, and there are reasons for this that we can get into. At the same time, the value of real estate has been skyrocketing. Uh, as of about two years ago, global real estate was worth $217 trillion, or 60% of the world's assets, or 75% of the world's wealth. And the fact that this much wealth and value is being pumped into real estate is a big part of the reason why we have a crisis and why this, this amount of wealth is being pumped in. Um, but I think it's also worth, at this time, when people are looking at the history of the United States more seriously and looking at the origin of various institutions like, say, the police in serious ways, I think it's worth examining a bit the origin of property and housing in the United States. So we tend to view things like property and money as being neutral as being uh, you know, indifferent to who you are and where you come from. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that that's not the case and that property and housing in the United States uh, not only have a racial history, but are actually have a, have a racial existence. Uh, so 
in the invention of the white race, which I've just started, uh, Theodore W. Allen points out that the assault on the pushing um, indigenous people off their land was the main objective of uh, American policy until about the 19th century, when the, there was a shift towards not just simply pushing people off the land, but changing the way that the remaining indigenous people were able to own the land that was left to them. Uh, so for instance, he quotes Indian commissioner T.J. Morgan in 1889 saying, the Indians must conform to the white man's ways, peaceably if they will, forcibly if they must. The tribal relations should be broken up, socialism destroyed, and the family and autonomy of the individual substituted. His use of the word socialism is probably not accidental because it was, this quote comes from the same year that the Second Socialist International was founded. Uh, the year before, um, Commissioner Oberly condemned, quote, the degrading communism of Indian tribal ownership where, quote, neither can say of all the acres of the tribe, this is mine. And throughout the, the literature of the policies of the time, you see an attempt to change the social relations of the indigenous people so that they would be more compatible with uh, those of American capitalism. And what's suggested here is part of the threat that they, that they uh, viewed here was that perhaps these people would be influential. I mean, not only would they not be co-opted into uh, American capitalist society, but that they would be, pose a danger in influencing uh, working people in the United States uh, who were learning a thing or two about opposing capitalism from elsewhere. In 1917, this accelerates. Uh, Richard Rothstein, in his book, The Color of Law, says, terrified by the 1917 Russian Revolution, government officials came to believe that communism could be defeated in the United States by getting as many white Americans as possible to become homeowners. The idea being that those who owned property would be invested in the capitalist system. So they create an own your own home campaign. They hand out, uh, we own our own home buttons to school children and they distribute pamphlets saying it's a patriotic duty to cease renting and build a single family unit. Um, Herbert Hoover creates an organization that Franklin Roosevelt is a member of and so on and so forth. And this is an objective that's produced in 1917 and not fully realized till after World War II, but they're working on it the entire time. The actual suburban design that is realized after World War II is developed in the 1930s and is only not used because of the depression and the war. And there's many reasons for this, but it really should be noted that one of the reasons was very much racial, that the ability to create uh, suburbs uh, was backed by federal government policies, um, which explicitly and very actively excluded non-white people from the creation of home ownership in this period. And I'm talking after World War II up till maybe the 1980s at the very least. So the Federal Housing Administration not only refused to give loan guarantees to loans uh, for a housing that would be, that would house non-white people, specifically, especially African-Americans, but would remove your right to get a Federal Housing uh, Administration guaranteed loan if you rented to somebody who was not white. So for instance, one teacher briefly rented his house to a black coworker and the FBI investigated and his right to ever get an FHA um, backed loan was removed for the rest of his right, uh, for, uh, for the rest of his life. The FDIC also only insured bank accounts for white Americans. The GI Bill um, backed home yeah, loans and, left. oh geez, can I get like a, Three minute extension? Sure, go ahead. Okay, thanks. GI Bill works similarly. In other words, there was a collection of laws which Richard Rothstein convincingly argues um, created a, uh, a form of racial segregation in the North that was at least as strong as that in the South. I think you could 
argue, in fact, was much stronger because it involved um, federal authority in a very serious way. It, it also would involve backing mob violence. And that these programs, this federal policy created the wealth that uh, Reverend Johnson noted in, in Connecticut, in, in various Connecticut suburbs. It's not some accidental thing, it was planned. Um, and it served various purposes, one of which was to subsidize industry, um, but another of which was very clearly to, to promote a kind of white nationalism which uh, has been you know, recently mobilized by most prominently Donald Trump uh, in order to, on the one hand, serve as a reaction against the, the struggles of um, non-white peoples in the United States, but also as a way of uh, disorienting white workers and displacing class struggle with race struggle, most specifically race struggle against non-white peoples. Um, now, that's the background, but in the present period, and this is where we come to the whole, the, this massive concentration of capital in real estate. Over the last several decades, uh, manufacturing, not just in the US, but worldwide, has seen an, an increasing amount of automation. And that automation in the long run means a drop in profits in manufacturing. And so those with money, those with capital, increasingly look to other places to invest their capital. In 2008, 2009, we, we got a look at what that looked like, financial derivatives, but also very much property, creating housing bubbles, property bubbles. And so this means uh, what their goal is when they invest in property, they want to make that property as valuable as possible so they can charge as high rents as possible. They also want policies that allow them to avoid maintaining those properties as much as they possibly can. So that you have people with, living in dilapidated homes who are pay, paying extraordinary rents because the local and state and federal government uh, are pursue policies that allow landlords to um, charge those kinds of rents and with, with, with as little maintenance as necessary. Um, and so this is part of the reason why we have uh, a, a long-term housing crisis, not just a short-term COVID-induced you know, housing crisis. And it's a housing crisis that I think 2008, 2009 um, collapse showed is going to be a housing crisis for everybody, uh, even though it is very much the, 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 the thin edge, uh, not everybody, it's, it's a housing crisis that is, is not going to stop with people of color, although that is definitely because of the historic way in which property has been formed in this country, um, that is the, the, uh, the main starting point and the, the, the most serious place where, where this crisis is going to happen. Um, however, because of the long-term crisis of American capitalism and world capitalism, uh, no one is really, no, no working person is safe from this kind of crisis. So uh, really, we should be talking about, I mean, cancellation of rent is a very important demand. But I think also, our, okay, but also our movement, I think, needs to take on certain long-term objectives like those that we have, say, in fights for healthcare rights. So for instance, in healthcare, at this point, it's common sense that we should be fighting for single payer or nationalized or, or public health care of some kind or another. Similarly, we should be fighting for housing as a human right, and that is, and that is materially secured through public ownership of housing. And we should be fighting for reparations that undo the racialized nature of housing and property in this country. Um, we can talk more about what this looks like and how to get there in the discussion. I've already gone on too long. Oh, one, one last thing though. I think that in addition to organizing people as renters, this movement is, is going to become more powerful as it takes on more of a political orientation and as, as uh, people begin to organize around housing rights as working people, because people don't just have power as renters, they also have power at the point of production.